the first germ of forgiveness of blood was uh, reading about these blood feuds that take place in Albania that are situations where someone has gotten angry or drunk and killed someone else, and then as a result, their family technically owes blood. They owe a life. It uh, sounds very simple. It sounds like an eye for an eye, but it really has its root in a code uh, that goes back many hundreds of years and has evolved over time. It's effectively an oral tradition that still holds sway um, in northern Albania especially. It's sort of a parallel judicial system, and it has a very specific set of rules about what to do if uh, someone is killed, if they're killed under certain circumstances. If it's, a, if it's a woman that's killed, it's different than if it's a man. Question of what happens to the kids in these situations, what it's like to be a teenager who's completely modern um, and living a living life in present-day Albania and using Facebook and cell phones. What happens to them when uh, the there's someone from their father's generation kills someone and they find themselves stuck in a blood feud. So is that really that juxtaposition between the old and the new, between the traditional and the modern that was of interest to me. Okay, well can you tell me a bit about that casting process? Because like you said, you have some uh, amateur actors in the, in the lead roles and they're so natural you, you think they are professional actors, which sounds backwards, but tell me about finding them. Well, the, the most challenging roles to find were the lead actor and actress. There was a 17-year-old boy and a 14 -year -old, his 14-year-old sister. And I always knew that they would be real kids. They wouldn't, there, there's no such thing really in, in Albania as a professional 14-year-old actress or 17-year-old actor. So it meant going from school to school to school. We spent about six months and went to close to 50 schools having short conversations, five, you know, five, ten minute conversation with each kid, asking, you know, who they were and something about themselves, and then some interesting question to try and get them to open up a little bit. And we must have seen about 3,000 kids over that six month period. And when we finally found these two that are in the film, it was quite immediate. You know, they have a real charisma. They're very natural and very spontaneous, and yet at the same time have a certain vulnerability that makes you really care for them. And they have, you know, these eyes that just, the, the camera just loves them. Our shooting schedule was uh, challenging. It was not impossible. We had 30 days. Uh, I think what made it challenging was the fact that we were in Albania. You know, there's not, there's not a lot of production support in northern Albania. There aren't feature films shooting there every day. And on the one hand, what that means is that people are very welcoming and um, this great uh, tradition of hospitality generally in Albania, but even more so, there's an excitement for a movie coming to town and people were interested in, in helping us. But by the same token, getting specific things um, were, you know, th the film-related things or, or even getting, sometimes getting people to get along with one another. Um, there was a, a lot of negotiating that, that went on. So was there a specific example or a day where you just thought temporarily, I've had enough, this is too hard? Well, there were some things where, uh, you know, if I'd been shooting in New York, it would have been just about getting the, the local professional, um, whether it was a scene that involved, uh, you know, shooting a gun through glass and having the glass break, or uh, we had to burn down a structure. There's an arson that happens, and there aren't really pyrotechnic um, experts in Albania. And so when the time came, we doused this building uh, with gasoline. And the fire department, such as it was, doesn't, did, uh, didn't have a fire truck, really. And I remember the, the pyrotechnic expert that the producers had finally found, who he had worked on one film many years before, and he was now driving a taxi. And we had gotten him up for the movie, and he looked at our situation, and you know we had chainsawed a four-foot gap between the structure and the house, and to prevent the fire from spreading. And he looked at it and he said, "You'll be fine. Don't worry." And so we felt quite confident. And then I turned, and I turned back again, and I looked down, and I realized he was stepping on something, and he was putting out his cigarette. He was standing a few feet away from the structure that we just doused in gasoline. So. I was a little bit nervous. We had one take to get it, and um, pretty much what you see on screen in terms of the, uh, the way the, uh, the characters are responding to it, that's quite real as far as what the actors were going through.